Thanks, Jennifer. Um, thank you to the organizing committee and uh, Moral uh, for inviting me to speak today. Um, I was uh, asked to speak about thoracic aortic aneurysms and surgical thresholds in 2018. Uh, in the next few minutes, I'll try to go through uh, a few uh, important areas. One uh, is to remind ourselves of the lens with which we view this, this disease. Why do we perform prophylactic aortic operations in this population? Um, we'll emphasize the importance of tailored and personalized decision making. Uh, talk a little bit about what kind of data the guidelines are based on. Uh, and then dive into the disease-specific thresholds for our various subsets of thoracic aortic disease. We'll do a quick scan of uh, the Canadian, American, and European guidelines um, that have emerged over the last decade, uh, and, and then uh, summarize at the end. Um, I'll just start with a comment that prior to 2010, there was no guideline statement in thoracic aortic disease. And it's important to note that uh, the awareness of the disease was such that um, the aortic disease was lumped in frequently with valvular heart disease in terms of providing those kinds of uh, clinical tools. So there has been significant improvement in recognizing aortic disease as its own entity, and as such, multiple iterations of guidelines have emerged, um, each with their um, strengths and, and their weaknesses. So we'll start with a case presentation that's um, uh, fairly generic that many of us can relate to. Um, a, a gentleman in their 40s presents with atypical chest pain, no significant risk factors except for remote smoking history, um, a little bit of hypertension, and because of this atypical chest pain, they undergo a transthoracic echo. This echo shows dilatation of the ascending aorta. Uh, at 54 millimeters, aortic root at 41 millimeters, a tri-leaflet aortic valve, no significant valvular disease, normal ejection fraction. So here's the present patient that now presents to our clinic, um, and we're uh, asked to make a decision on uh, whether this patient needs intervention or not. So just a reminder of what lens we're, we're viewing this disease from, um, what we really want to prevent is an acute aortic syndrome. Um, and that's the picture on the right-hand side. Because acute aortic syndromes are associated with substantial mortality and morbidity. Uh, it's estimated that up to 40% of patients who have an acute aortic, system, uh, acute aortic syndrome will die before presenting to hospital. This number is very difficult to pin down uh, because there aren't autopsy studies available in many sudden deaths, but this is an estimate. Following diagnosis, uh, if the patient is not taken to surgery, uh, then there's an estimated risk of 1% per hour uh, of mortality, which is probably the most uh, lethal disease that we know of. If surgery is performed, uh, it carries a risk of approximately 20% of in-hospital mortality. And if the patient survives all that, they live with both the short-term and long-term morbidity associated with having a dissected aorta, uh, which may include uh, recovery from stroke, renal failure, uh, visceral ischemia, um, ongoing monitoring, and late uh, interventions to treat the remaining aortopathy. On the other side is elective aortic procedures. And elective aortic procedures uh, with improvements in techniques and management of these patients can now be performed at a fairly low risk of mortality and morbidity. So the, the typical mortality rate for an aortic root and ascending aortic procedure is between one and 2% when performed electively. Uh, when procedures involve the aortic arch or the descending thoracic aorta, open procedures carry a higher risk of neurologic morbidity and longer recovery. It's an effective therapy because uh, once a particular segment of aorta has been treated, the risk of reintervention on that segment is extremely low. There are exceptions to that rule. Uh, in cases where a prosthetic valve has to be implanted or a patient undergoes a TVAR procedure, there is the need for ongoing monitoring as well as sometimes reinterventions. So our goal when we're seeing these patients is to then identify those ones that are at high risk of aortic complications so that we can select them for prophylactic aortic replacement. And in doing so, we're in our minds weighing the risks on one hand of intervention-related complications, so more bet mortality, morbidity, reintervention rates, the need perhaps for aortic valve interventions, to on the other hand, mitigating the risks of natural history, which include risk of dissection and rupture, and the associated mortality and morbidity associated with that. One thing we often don't consider, but probably should and, and need more data on, is the impact on quality of life, impact on professional choices, impact on lifestyle choices for these patients on both sides of that spectrum. <clears throat> 
So we realize that there are many risks, or many variables rather, that will increase the risk of aortic complications. These are list listed on the left. Um, so high, a larger aortic size, the presence of a known connective tissue disorder, family history of aortopathy, bicuspid aortic valve disease, rapid growth, uncontrolled hypertension. These will increase the natural history risk. And on the other hand, um, Involvement of the aortic arch or descending thoracic aorta, uh, pulmonary disease, renal disease, prior cardiac surgery, advanced age, and LV dysfunction are some of the factors that will increase the risk of surgical intervention. The first recommendation that came out of our uh, CCS uh, guideline statement on aortic disease was that, uh, in fact, there isn't a single guideline uh, or size threshold that we can use for every patient, and that in every patient, the decision needs to be tailored to that individual patient, taking into account patient-related and disease-related factors. And I would add another layer to this. I think it's important to add center-specific or surgeon-specific um, data to this as well. So moving on to the next point, um, what are the guideline recommendations based on? When we think about a guidelines document, uh, it would be nice in an ideal world to know the natural history of the disease, to know the uh, morbidity associated with intervention, and to know whether intervening on that disease actually alters the natural history of the disease. Unfortunately, we don't have that data for thoracic aortic disease. That key missing link is not present. So there are no randomized controlled trials supporting the currently recommended size thresholds in aortic surgery. Uh, if you scan the literature, and we've recently completed, completed meta-analysis that did exactly this, there are only a handful of multi-center studies from which the natural history data is derived. There are few prospective studies, um, often tending to be single-center, that describe natural history risk and surgical outcomes. And the bulk of the literature is actually retrospective studies examining both natural history of risk and outcomes following aortic surgery. The average study size is in the range of 450 patients. So this speaks to the limitations we have when members from this group and others sit on guidelines committees and try to pinpoint a number uh, at which patients should undergo intervention. Uh, along with this, we have data from the IRAD registry that tells us that our, our previously um, uh, marker, previous marker for uh, aortic surgery at 5.5 centimeters is clearly not sufficient in identifying patients who are at risk. So the median uh, diameter at which aortic dissections tend to occur is in fact 5.3 centimeters. And this is even more striking for descending thoracic aortic aneurysms and acute type B aortic dissection where the median diameters 4.1 centimeters, whereas our guidelines tend to be 5.5 or higher for surgical intervention. Um, when we worked on the Canadian position statement on this issue, we decided to break our recommendations down into the various subcategories of thoracic aortic disease with the idea that more tailored uh, uh, thresholds might in fact help to mitigate uh, some of the cloudiness around the recommendations. Um, as has been mentioned by other speakers, uh, our, the, the, most, um, the best data, I would say, and the one that's driven the guidelines the greatest uh, has come from the Yale group. Um, and this is a large cohort uh, of um, close to 800 patients uh, in whom uh, natural history risk was studied. Um, in this population, about 10% of the patients were Marfans, and about three-quarters of the patients had primarily ascending aortic disease. They had 92 events occur in their cohort. And their recommendation, uh, which has really uh, driven uh, the surgical treatment over the past three or four decades, is that for degenerative aortic aneurysms in the ascending aorta, uh, our threshold would be 5.5 centimeters, as there tends to be an inflection point uh, of risk beyond that. For the same, uh, same type of pathology in the arch or descending thoracic aorta, given that the risks of intervention are higher, um, and at that time considering largely open interventions, the threshold was higher at uh, 6 to 6.5 centimeters. Um, the, if you think that the problem of natural history risk for ascending aortic aneurysms is bad, it's a lot worse for the descending thoracic aorta, where there's very little known in terms of the natural history risk uh, of dissection and rupture. <clears throat> 
Um, for bicuspid aortic valve disease, there are really only a handful of prospective cohorts that have looked at the risk of aneurysm formation and aortic-related complications. And largely the conclusion is that the risk of aortic dissection is in fact quite low uh, in the bicuspid uh, aortic valve population. However, the risk of developing aortopathy and requiring an aortic intervention uh, progresses over time, reaching up to 40% of patients. Um, our, the recommendation from the Canadian guidelines uh, statement was that uh, surgery should be considered between 5.0 and 5.5 centimeters, um, largely at 5.5, but realizing that in some patients, uh, adjusting for body size, adjusting for other red flags like family history um, or rapid dilatation might uh, push you towards intervening sooner uh, in this population. The third cohort that we separate out was uh, patients with Marfan syndrome, um, and uh, some of the best data in the Marfan population comes from this uh, paper in 2012 with the cohort of 732 Marfan patients. And this uh, paper noted that the risk of aortic complications below the size of five centimeters was substantially low um, and really rapidly increased beyond five centimeters. And this, along with other uh, smaller observational studies, led to the recommendation that uh, the threshold used in Marfan syndrome should be five centimeters, uh, as it involves the aortic root and ascending aorta. Once we get beyond this point, uh, other subcohorts of disease are much harder to pin down. Uh, they represent a heterogeneous cohort, as we've heard from many of the earlier speakers. Um, the virulence of each of those diagnoses is not often clear, and there's a spectrum within each of these uh, disease subtypes, where you t whether you talk about Lewis Dietz syndrome, um, Turner syndrome, uh, other familial aerotopathies. Um, we treat familiar aortopathies uh, with a lot of care um, as uh, we realize that this is a highly virulent group. There has been demonstration that the growth rates in this population are higher than the general population and that likely the risk of aortic complications is higher than that seen in degenerative disease, bicuspid aortic valve disease, and Marfan syndrome. Um, for both familial aerotopathy and other genetic syndromes, the, there's a wide range of uh, what would be acceptable surgical thresholds. Um, and again, uh, this is an area where uh, it's, it would be recommended that the patient be evaluated by a multidisciplinary team, which has the expertise to then uh, look deeper into the potential uh, risk factors and make a decision that's tailored to the patient. And lastly, uh, patients undergoing concomitant cardiac surgery, most commonly uh, aortic valve surgery, um, in these patients, while the primary indication is uh, non-aortic, we realize that leaving behind a dilated aorta may require a higher risk operation in the future, or uh, what's worse, uh, treatment of an aortic dissection in that context uh, can be um, substantially higher risk as well. And it is for that reason that patients undergoing uh, concomitant cardiac surgery um, are recommended to undergo uh, aortic replacement when their aortic uh, size is 4.5 centimeters. There are some common sense um, uh, elements that we all use in our daily practice. One of them is indexing for patient size. Um, this uh, graph simply shows that uh, as body surface area increases, the normal range of aortic diameters also increases, as one would expect. Uh, many of us adjust for patient size empirically, so we sometimes use different thresholds for females versus males. We take into account the patient's height and body surface area. There are more formal methods of indexing for size, uh, and um, unfortunately only a handful of studies that look at index size as a predictor of aortic complications. And so it is difficult to incorporate these into our guidelines because the data still uh, is not uh, very robust. Um, a third method of adjustment is cross-sectional area divided by the height. This is used uncommonly, um, but there are a few publications suggesting that this is also a predictive parameter. In addition to those adjustments, there are uh, other considerations like presence of symptoms. Um, although symptoms are rarely attributable to aortic disease, there are uh, scenarios in which all other causes of symptoms uh, have been ruled out. Uh, and in some cases, particularly those with inflammatory disease, pain can be uh, associated with the aortic aneurysm itself. And in those cases, surgical intervention should be considered earlier. 
Uh, and pseudoaneurysms are not specifically addressed, uh, but they represent a, a different entity uh, in whom uh, the specific anatomic criteria need to be looked at when deciding on thresholds for intervention. Lastly, expected rate of growth. Um, in a recent meta-analysis, uh, we were able to show that the expected, or the average growth rate, rather, of uh, aneurysms, small aneurysms in the four to five uh, centimeter range is actually 0.6 millimeter, or 0.06 centimeters per year. Uh, while in the past we used to think of rapid growth as being greater than five millimeters per year, um, there is increasing recognition that even uh, uh, growth rates as low as three uh, millimeters per year would be considered significant in, in rapid dilatation. In these cases, uh, earlier surgical intervention would be warranted. So this then uh, became uh, the table that uh, our, uh, the Canadian group de derived uh, in trying to uh, recommend size thresholds for the various subtypes of aortic disease. Now when you do the scan across uh, the pond uh, and across the border, um, there are minor variations, but in fact, the most recent versions of the guidelines um, from all the three uh, major society groups uh, tend to converge. So for degenerative aortic aneurysms, um, the guidelines uh, in all three suggest that asymptomatic patients should be treated at a size of 5.5 centimeters. For bicuspid aortic valve disease, uh, the Canadian group said between 5 and 5.5. Um, the European guidelines suggest 5.5 as the, as the primary threshold, but if patients have risk factors, some of which we alluded to, family history, rapid dilatation, uh, small body surface area, that 5 centimeters would be appropriate, and those undergoing concomitant surgery would be 4.5. And similar uh, recommendations come from the American groups. Marfan syndrome, there's also a fair degree of concordance in the size thresholds for intervention. Um, as we get f uh, into the other subtypes, uh, Louis Dietz syndrome uh, or Turner syndrome, there's a, a wide range of recommendations and there's absence of data. And it's really very difficult to make a, uh, any overarching recommendation for this population. Ultimately, it becomes a, an expert decision of a multidisciplinary team uh, looking at the patient's individual factors. But the ranges uh, vary anywhere from 4.0 to 5.0 in terms of thresholds. So I'm going to move on to my summary, which is uh, that the decision to recommend surgery should be personalized and tailored to the patient. Uh, and in fact, that should be the primary recommendation uh, when looking at size thresholds. That the current guidelines are really based uh, largely on retrospective assessment of risks of natural history versus outcomes of aortic replacement. And uh, that missing piece of whether aortic intervention prophylactically actually alters natural history risk uh, remains to be uh, determined. There is a general concordance uh, between the Canadian, American, and European guidelines. Uh, there were iterations of these guidelines that were more discordant, but the more recent iterations, in fact, uh, tend to converge on similar recommendations. And lastly, there's a need for more robust prospective studies and randomized trials to better inform decision making in this population. And I'll add a couple of comments on this. Um, you know, we are not, uh, in the thoracic aortic disease literature, not the only ones to deal with this problem. Our vascular surgery colleagues have uh, done this uh, in small aortic aneurysms in the abdominal aorta, and large randomized trials now uh, really do inform uh, the size threshold. So this is a basically a call to action to all of us uh, who are involved in this disease to, um, to be more involved in randomized trials in this population. Thank you. Any questions? I have a question. Hi, hi Munir. So um, another area where our vascular surgery colleagues have done a lot more research than we have is the role of, of sex, of male versus female, and you had that up on one of your slides. I was wondering if you can comment a little bit about if, if that influences your, your practice at all in terms of your cutoffs or, or how you use that. Yeah, um, so that's a great question, actually. I think that uh, there are two issues at play in my view. One is um, the, the fact that women tend to be smaller and is this a body, simply a body size adjustment? Um, or the second, is there any biological uh, difference that actually accounts for higher mortality or morbidity in women because of uh, the sex? 
And um, I think both are at play, uh, personally. I think that uh, certainly the body size adjustment is something that should be done in, in our day-to-day -day practice. But beyond that, I think there's more and more data, um, uh, and there's a, a certainly a, a cardiologist with a vested interest in this in, in our group, that has shown uh, that uh, the rate of aortic disease progression or dilatation is higher in women uh, than men after adjusting for body size, and that um, the risk of aortic complications has a tendency to be higher. Now, these are relatively small cohort studies, so patients uh, in the range of 150 to 200 patients, uh, but I think this is an area that does need a more directed study um, before we can conclusively say that there should be divergence in the guideline recommendations, but I think there are some signals there that we should be treating women differently than men. Thank you. Thanks so much, Munir. Thank you.